Um, aloha mai kako and welcome. Aloha. 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 Mahalo nui for coming and joining us this morning. Um, we've been uh, often using the term activation um, and are just grateful to have a community um, to share this conversation with and um, to our panelists and everyone. So mahalo nui again for joining us today. Um, my name is Mina Ellison. I'm the curator here at the Donkey Mill Art Center. And, <laughs> um, and um, again, I'm just really humbled and honored to have this incredible panel of my peers and friends and mentors um, joining us from, this is a great list, Aotearoa. We have Los Angeles represented, Honolulu, um, Fiji, Via Hilo, <laughs> and Kao Kaha. So let's give our presenters yeah. 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 very excited. I think when we plan these things, it's, it comes from a really deep interest of like hearing of what they're going to say <laughs> and um, just telling stories and being honest with each other. And, and um, really looking forward to that. So, mahalo. Um, our exhibition, Michael Poli, Representations of Moana Nui Akea, opened two weeks ago. And honestly, myself and, and a lot of the artists um, still processing, I think, what it meant to be in the space and to activate the space in that way when um, Marcus Marzan put on his piece and danced in it. It, it really changed the, the energy of this entire place. And, reminded me of how important um, it is to see art, um, the treasures that are held at LACMA, how they are all living, living beings, and how do we care for them in that way, knowing that, um, that the artwork is alive, it has life, it has mana. Mm -hmm. And um, by sharing that with our community, knowing who we are, discovering that, it gives us life too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we can share that in our community um, and through the work that that we become inspired to do what becomes our kuleana and responsibility. Um, so we're still on a high from that, which is really great um, to feel. And um, you know, all of our panelists today are really activators in themselves, are invited to share their work, their important work with us, um, because their work really empowers others. Um, you know, whether it is their artwork, or their work taking care of collections um, here and abroad, work in the community as educators. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that in the work that you all do, and um, it's important, and we're so grateful for that. So again, mahalo. And before I introduce our facilitator today, um, I'd like to express my gratitude for our dedicated meal team, uh, which is led by our newly appointed executive director. And also to our uh, board members, Natasha Alla is here, so thank you very much. Um, and then a very special mahalo to the Hawaii Council for Humanities, which specifically is supporting this incredible event. They're helping us with the lunch, um, with the exhibition as well. Um, and the Lila Twig Smith Art Fund of the Hawaii Community Foundation, which supports our residency program, um, which brought Michael Tuffery here for two weeks. Um, oh, yeah. And it's been an incredible journey for all of us. He's been connecting with, with community in, in so many different ways, um, important ways, and again, we look forward to a long relationship um, across <laughs> cross culture um, pollinations <laughs> and connectivity. So, mahalo nui. He is going back home tomorrow, and are just, oh. we're just all really <laughs> um, sad, but yeah, we know it will continue on. So, mahalo nui, Michael. Mahalo. And i um, like to uh, mahalo the Hawaii State Foundation on Culture and the Arts, by a name grant, as well as our incredible county council members, um, Dr. Holeka Bo'inaba and Rebecca Viegas. So, we are very grateful. Okay, on to the good stuff. 
um, Helena Kapuni Reynolds, right here. Uh, Kanaka Uivi was born on Hawaii Island and raised um, in the Hawaiian homestead community of Kelkaha uh, in the upper rainforest of Ola'a. He holds a BA in Anthropology and Hawaiian Studies from the University of Hawaii at Hilo, an MA in Anthropology with a focus in Museum and Heritage Studies from the University of Denver, um, and is currently a doctoral student in Museum Studies and American Studies at UH Manoa. So he's been a huge supporter of all things museums, cultural empowerment, and uh, a dear friend who I love dearly. Yeah, so. of Hinano and Lehua blossoms greet you in a house of Lehua enveloped by the mist. It is indeed my desire and the desire of Donkey Mail Art Center staff and our our esteemed panelists today to greet you. Um, and we wait, have waited in anticipation for your arrival. You've arrived with love and affection. Aloha to you all. Belina me ke aloha e na hoa makamaka i akoko mai nei i ke ala Maka'aina kupuna o ke ho. Greetings to everyone who has gathered here today on the ancestral lands of ke ho to join us for our panel discussion, Mai Kamaka Ike, Visualizing Identity Through Representation. In conjunction with the exhibit, Mai Kapo'uli, Representations of Moana Nui Akea, this panel considers how historical photographic collections are given new meaning through art making and curation. Joining me today are four accomplished individuals whose experiences and insights will guide us on this conversational journey. Our panel will begin with short presentations by each panelist, followed by a brief conversation amongst the panelists regarding the value of historical photographic collections, as well as Pacific Museum collections in general, to, um, for the present and the future. And our panel will end with ample time for questions. Um, answers as well as time for discussion. So we really encourage you folks to participate and engage with the kuka kuka or conversation that will take place today. So to kind of just jump right into it, um, I'd like to introduce each of our panelists um, in the order that they will present and then we'll jump right into our presentations. So first, we will have Michael. Uh, Michael Tuffery is a New Zealand based artist of Samoan, Rarotongan and Maohi Tahitian heritage. Within his art practice, he plays the role of working in between people and places and focusing a fresh lens on environments, on environmental, community, cultural, and art historical device divides. Michael is a passionate educator who openly shares his kawapapa and knowledge to empower our youth through residencies and workshops for school-aged children in New Zealand and abroad. He exhibits worldwide and has undertaken research and community residencies throughout the USA, Germany, France, the United Kingdom, Asia, India, Australia, as well as Aotearoa in the Pacific. In 2008, Michael was appointed as a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit for his services to art. His ongoing rewards come from enriching communities through art. Welcome, Michael. Next, we have Joy Heinen. Did I pronounce that right? Joy Heinen. <laughs> So Joey is a digital preservation and time-based media specialist currently serving as digital preservation manager in the collection information and digital assets department and head of the time-based media committee at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. In his role, he ensures the long-term sustainability and authentic representation of time-based art and digital archival work collections, including audiovisual installation, computer and software-based work, and digitized and born digital materials. 
He got graduated from the Moving Image Archiving and Preservation MA program at New York University in 2014. And during his tenure, he worked in the New York University's Film Preservation Lab, um, digitized audio for anthology film archives, and served as a media collection and digitization assistant for new media artists such as Steina and Woody Vosoka. He has worked in a variety of cultural heritage institutions across the galleries, libraries, archives, and museum space, and is a digital and AV collections consultant through the Myriad Consulting Group. As a part of the collection information and digital assets team at LACMA, he helps to maintain and enhance data procedures related to all LACMA collections, as well as facilitating new methods for community stewardship and data modeling to allow for many forms of storytelling and historicization. So welcome, Joey. Next is Anne-Marie Aveal Paikai, and she is the Hawaii Pacific Resource Librarian at Leeward Community College and has been so since November 2016. She holds a BA in Hawaiian Studies from Kahakaula Oke'elikolani and a Master's in Library and Information Sciences from UH Manoa. She is a founding member of Na Hawaii Imiloa, the professional organization whose mission is to advance Hawaiian knowledge systems, services, and research within library information sciences. Anne-Marie is dedicated to stewarding and centering Ike Ku'una Hawaii, or ancestral knowledge, including Olalo Hawaii, the Hawaiian language, within the library profession here in Hawaii, as well as within her own ohana. She was born and raised in Livermore, California, and currently lives alongside her husband, Aina, and two children, Kapalua and Emilia, in Waiau, Oahu. Welcome, Anne-Marie. <laughs> Last but not least, we have the incredible Dr. T, Teresi Munedilo. Uh, Teresi is an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Hawaii at Hilo, where she teaches courses on indigenous museology and heritage management. In 2016, she received her PhD in Pacific Studies from the Center of Pacific Island Studies at the University of Auckland. Her thesis was titled, Iao Vakaviti, Fijian Treasures, Cultural Rights, and Repatriation of the Cultural Materials from International Museums. Teresi published several articles about Fijian pottery, language, and archaeology, and is currently working on two book manuscripts. Her current area of research is museology, repatriation, and indigenous knowledge and language revitalization. Welcome, Teresi. All right. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our panelists. I'll also be kind of serving as timekeeper, but we've kind of covered this in advance. So everything sh so I shouldn't have to worry too much. About that. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> but on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Michael, and I will change slides for you guys. Thank you. Yeah. I'll get on with the seven or ten approximation of ten minutes. <laughs> um, I'm just going to talk through the process that we're going with the tamariki that we've been working on these beautiful prints that are on this wall over here. And it's in response to like our photo album, which is over this side, and the value of actually using factual documentation, or how do we look at an image. <clears throat> so I'm just going to run you through a process, like this is only screenshots of a Miro board that we had available to the students to access how, how my process actually works. And basically, like just taking the one photograph, like this uh, the middle photograph here is the four mutus in the 1940s. Uh, 43 or 46 and in response what I did is I put all the images that uh, spoke to me of the narrative of the nuclear testing that was going on in Mururua in French Polynesia. So there was an image of uh, a cousin who, well, and a sister that has the similar gesture. It was just a beautiful image of her laughing in, in, the, uh, in the image. I know it looks really simple but it was the bulo or the hat um, and what I was doing was trying to teach the students how do you dissect the actual image, what speaks to you. So rather than sort of copying the, old, uh, copying the whole image, what we were, I was trying to do was just go through the process of dissection. Not just looking at the front, but looking in the middle and the back, and then turning the paper around slowly like what process and what year it was born. So then, then comes the response, and if you see on the wall these are just like, uh, we, the students, what we did is dissect the image and what spoke to you. So through this beautiful collection, the next image, um, be, uh, 
for three or four months, you know, it was a slow process like of the images coming up. But at the same time, there was these emotional up and down uh, reactions and responses. Now, I am from very familiar with some of the collections from Tetisville or Andrews in Samoa. And there were some beautiful images that um, Joey had sent through that I sort of know uh, it's just all staged. And why were they staged? So I use these as vehicles. Uh, this one here, we always talk about sustenance or food. And I'm really passionate about like our traditional food because unfortunately we have the highest stats in Samoa. For example, like 80% of the women with diabetes with processed food. So what I basically do, and again, going back to the mural board, I went to uh, King Kamehameha High School with Ka uh, Kyle, and there was this beautiful pro uh, photograph. I grabbed the two, and these the two were actually speaking to each other. The uru, we still eat you know, our traditional food in Samoa, but unfortunately, they call traditional food like the, the spam can or the corned beef. So it's just challenging those like the words traditional and the sustenance. And so it's just like these like recording devices, like these photographs are really good vehicles for our community to talk about what foods that we eat in the past. I try to choose opportunities to, uh, to present them in, uh, in front of the students, like why am I looking at this process? It's just talking about our body shape and what we were eating. Our gym was actually the plantation. So that's what I sort of like trying to make references like that. And even the food that we consume like for mental well-being. So, uh, next image. Uh, and this, while well, talking about the gym, uh, you know, not the gym that you go and get your weights, it's planting the karu. And part of the residency's program, which I requested from Mina, was to go and spend time in the plantation, track down the taro species, because we, and COVID was a great thing that happened in Morotoma, because we were able to trade the old school way with our karu word, and we, we almost had a riot because the mayonnaise and the chicken, the KFC wasn't coming into Rotoma. <laughs> <laughs> so this gave us a chance to reassess, reassess what value, you know, food values that we were eating, what we were impa uh, imparting with the tamariki there. So the school system has changed you know, since COVID. And it was a great thing, we stopped all the tourists. And my uh, uncle, Mike Tepioni, if you ever come to Rotorua, he's the little dude that looks like a, um, oh no, I won't go there. But again, <laughs> it's talking about like, uh, our traditional foods, our traditional carving. And these photographs, when you start to dissect it, and talk about what we looked like, and how the place, uh, plantation was set out. So these, um, again, this has been going, this is a process I've been doing for years and it's a, it's a, it's a very solid team plate. So it doesn't matter where the diaspora lives in California or France, because there's a lot of Asians living over there and Marquesans. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to run these particular workshops using these documentations or using these devices. So I'm just talking about like the value, the value of the photographic collection. And I feel it's my responsibility, yes, to give them the template, but to empower their information and just question you know, where we are on any part of the, the planet. Uh, next image. So again, a very simple plantation. This is a, a long uh, project I've worked in Deutschland for quite a long time. I worked with the German Army Brass Band in Berlin and the Samoan Police Brass Band in Samoa. And this is, again, using photographic uh, images that we were doing stealth missions to uh, the little villages. This is a, a classic example. As you see, we basically were talking about a plantation that was set up by um, a, a gentleman named uh, Hufnaga. And he invented the whole process of uh, drying process for copra. So using that sort of history, but what we did with the brass bands is we played the old school music when we were under German rule in Samoa to set off that memory bank. Especially was aimed, the audience we were aiming at was the older ones. And what the whole idea was to get them to sing. And then all of a sudden, all those stories start the gossiping like, why, when did this all happen? So these are just devices. But what I'm saying is there's all these different vehicles, like from film, to poetry, to storytelling, to sculpture. So these are all little vehicles that I'm trying to share here on my residency, different devices, how we can tell that story.
and I'm going to leave it there for my panel to give them that space. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, <laughs> oh, okay. if you, do yeah. you want to kind of talk a little bit about the workshop we did with the students? So if, um, the, I'm not sure of the date, Nina, but Michael did a workshop with some students at Kekula o Ehunui Kaibalino. This is the Hawaiian language immersion school here in Kona. Um, what was it like for you? What was what were some of the students' reactions? Oh, look, um, again, it's solid team play, you know, and especially using the real. And this is the key thing with Indigenous teachers, and please don't get me wrong, but using our real, like uh, especially in Aotearoa or Rotunga or Daiti or Samoa, and we just, you know, which I would speak a little bit of Samoa or Cook Island Māori, and then there'll be similar sounds or similar things we're talking about, and th this, that's the engagement. And there's similar behaviours that um, there's probably seen in their uncle. So it's just, uh, it was just another, it was an easy process. But they did go quiet on the first day. We went on a very simple exercise, but then incorporating the exercise into the image. And my, there was no expectation um, with the finished work. It was all about just process. Just process, I can't even, you know, we, I didn't want uh, having a beautiful image at the end was just talking through that process as I'm showing here. Actually, there is one more slide I want to show. And again, process, oh. narrative. And it's the same process we were doing with woodcut. How do you incorporate like architecture, fa'asa more, um, tatouage. And again, if you see the bottom image down at the bottom, this is taking uh, the projectors, projecting old school images onto and animating them onto the German building in Samoa, in Apia. And the brass band is playing the music from that period and some of the old school music. So it's just looking for, I'm trying to depart like different devices. Um, just one more image. Yes, no, and again, talking about fishing practices with Uncle Chucky. And again, I got to the privilege of hearing the narrative, the narrative of him with that he looks after Cookie's memorial, mm. being displaced as a human being, and hearing the relationship pre-contact of Vancouver and Cookie. Mm -hmm. So it's just talking about relationship building. So again, uh, part of my residency, even though you're supposed to be doing pictures and all that sort of carry on, no, 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 it's all about trying to figure out how all these relationships work, like from the plantation, to the fishermen, to the weavers, and just going to the schools and just sharing that, but also get, trying to get, yeah, just a part of that knowledge and that process. So I was really honored to hang out with Uncle Chucky that day and uh, Ikone, just sharing their story about and sharing something similar in our fishing practices because some of that art form is, is actually dying off. So again, reviving that, that conversation and similarities in Fiki, you know, we So it's just trying to think. And that's what I love about these beautiful photographs, the photo album. It is opening up the photo album and open up that conversation. Perfect. There you go. Thank you. So, for folks who haven't seen the show yet, Michael is one of the artists that's exhibited here, so you can see some of the works in the show after our presentation. But also, please spend some time looking at the incredible work created by our Haumana here in Kona. Um, next, we're going to kind of pass it over to Joey, and I'm just, I'm going to slowly try to move it so that when you guys, it's your guys' turn, that you can see it. Okay. <laughs> uh, aloha, everyone. Um, really grateful to be here today. Um, just to also, you know, get to hear and learn from all the amazing knowledge that's here, um, and yeah, I mean, as was explained, my my skill set lies more in working with digital material in general, um, and really working at a much a, a very large scale of material and thinking about how do we systematize that, how do we, you know, consider all the myriad ways of looking at things and and talking about things and have that in some kind of record that, that lives on. Um, and so how I came into this project, um, well, I came into this collection through a project, um, through an IMLS grant, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, but it's just funny thinking back at 2018 when I started the project and had I known then what I know now and how you go about handling a collection of 10,000 images, initially I thought, well, we can do it. We can go through each and every one of these images and figure them out. And of course, now I know that that's not at all the case. Um, but, <laughs> but you know, what we what we can learn from that is is you know how we you know really honor the the living aspect of this collection, like Mina was saying. And then how do you kind of 
imbue that in, in, the, in how we handle it over time. Um, so here are some just examples of the images that we knew to be attributed to Hawaii at the time, because most of the, the knowledge that we had, um, apart from you know, one of our curators who's here today, um, but also you know, the knowledge that, that came inscribed on the images and you know, having to take that at face value. Um, but we did know that of these 10,000 images that uh, a vast majority were going to be based in Hawaii. Um, but then, you know, it was also represented across all the Pacific Islands and images that were gifted to LACMA in 2015 by a collector, uh, well, a, a couple, Mark and Carolyn Blackburn, who sourced most of these images from informal sales, markets, uh, estate sales, things of that nature. So many of the images are, are found in collections um, all around Pacific Island and, and especially in places like the Bishop Museum, uh, Hawaii State Archives, and places like that. Um, but we also um, were, we believed that there were going to be many uh, original images in there, possibly some that were closer to the original, so things that we wanted to be mindful of as we were working with these materials. Um, you can advance the next please. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, images were attributed to places all over the Pacific Islands. Um, and so we also had to think through the, um, you know, the, the nuances of each place and how we wanted to approach these images differently relative to where they came from, but then of course some images that we didn't know where they uh, originated from. Um, if you want to get to the next slide. Um, so what went from 2015 to a grant application from my former boss, Maya Clark, who was the former executive director of Donkey Mill, which not to not to um, spoiler alert, but like that's how this all came to be was uh, through through Maya Clark being at both LACMA and Donkey Mill. So that's what really started this relationship. Um, so Maya wrote that grant, um, but then when we were awarded the grant, Maya accepted the job here. So she asked <laughs> me if I would take over the, the project since I was already working closely with her. And I believe based on my experience with digitizing material at scale, um, was asked to take over the project. Um, and so we had three uh, part-time or full-time staff that were involved fully in this project. One who was registering the collection, um, one who was digitizing um, the collection, um, and one who was researching the collection. And those were all kind of staggered across the, the two-year period, but there was some period of overlaps, and um, particularly Luz, our, our amazing digitization assistant, and uh, Sedna, our amazing research assistant, worked really closely with us um, and, and in fact, they had to work in concert a lot um, to just kind of figure out protocols and handling and all of that. Um, but no small task, and um, Luz did an incredible job with, with these digital surrogates, which if there's one, I mean, there's several takeaways from this and, and many mistakes made, but lessons learned. And um, I think that we're all just really happy to have these in a digital form such that we can really start to, you know, seed them in, in places where we can start to actually aggregate the knowledge that really needs to be coupled with these images. Um, but so that was, you know, a lot of work, but completed in 2020. Um, but another component of the project, which if you could please advance the slide. Um, well, actually, just quickly, I regret how clinical this looks and pie charts in, in general, like, are, you know, setting specific. But uh, it just kind of gives you a sense of, of what we knew at the time to be the, the spread of the collection and, and what it was representing. Um, but yeah, an important thing that uh, you know had not been written to the, into the grant originally was really thinking about allied stewardship and working with um, practitioners, um, Kanaka Oiwi in Hawaii, but also across the Pacific Islands to to think about you know how we were working through the collection, to think about access and you know the the things that that a museum like LACMA needs to be thoughtful about in the future as we continue to collect, but also to, to care for collections is really um, breaking outside of, of our understanding of what that means. Um, and so we knew it was gonna be really important to start um, building connections and relationships through this project. Mm -hmm. um, if you could advance, please. Um, so I, I won't go over this one given the time restraints, but um, we, we started through our connections 
um, at UH Manoa and at uh, UCLA. Um, someone who is at the American Indian Studies Center at UCLA used to be at Kona Historical Society, so they were really helpful in just starting that process um, because I think through past projects, um, a lot of us at the museum have learned that um, cold calling and just um, arriving unannounced at, at, at people's doorsteps who have, have been living with this and working with this for a long time is not always an appreciated gesture. Um, it's really <laughs> about <laughs> meeting more than halfway, you know, going beyond what we, what we think is, you know, a, a sort of reciprocal arrangement and, and thinking about like how we can be better listeners, more thoughtful about, you know, what, what LACMA can do for others, not just for the collections, but to if we're to exist and to continue to to be caretakers of these materials, how can we, you know, change how the museum is structured to be more inclusive of other other ways of, of dealing with these ideas? Um, so, uh, if you could go to the next slide, thank you. So we we had a number of LACMA staff, so the grant hires um, and myself as well. Um, we also had Nancy Thomas, who's our Pacific curator here. Um, and then also um, our two chairs, which were our contacts at uh, UH Manoa and UCLA, as well as Maya, our former, um, our former head of the department and the uh, one who wrote the grant. Um, and that led us to then building a, a defined community of, of people to help us with going through the images, thinking about uh, LACMA and how our practice can change and the ways that we can yeah, just better think through how to do the, the important steps of providing access, knowing that it's a delicate balance between recklessly sharing things online and just putting things out there without having fully vetted them or, or, or really meditated on them versus gatekeeping, keeping them hidden from view, not, not even having them um, be aware that they're available for people who, who want to have a more direct um, engagement with them. Um, so that led us to our next team, um, which um, was also uh, representative uh, of uh, what we knew of the, the kind of spread of the collection is we really wanted to make sure we were working with individuals who were from those places but also work with collections and think about that kind of tension between, um, yeah, o overly sharing or putting things out without um, proper care versus things that then are sort of locked away. Um, so we were really lucky to get a number of people um, who have um, careers on the Big Island too. Some of you may know some of these um, names. But, um, and while many of them were, were mostly just working with us through the period of this project, it has grown into individual relationships that are spanning ideas, not unlike the one that's taking place at Donkey Mill. So um, as we've heard many times through, over the last few weeks, that this is just a first step, and I'm really hopeful that this can be used as a precedent for, for this collection finding itself in other spaces and just continuing this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, looks like these. So, and I just want to make a, a few plugs that, you know, we do have a small number of the images on our public collection site, and that was through conversation with our advisory board to really think through what are things that, um, you know, we feel we can, can put out there um, that are images that are seen elsewhere, maybe some, some ones that are not as widely seen, but are familiar faces, ones that we, we can say with confidence that we know who we're looking at or, or what we're looking at. Um, so that is one point of looking at it, but the collection for all intents and purposes is, is totally accessible. It's just a matter of, of finding me and being able to make requests and, and you know, this uh, exhibit was a great uh, experiment in learning how to do that in a sort of more curated way in, in a way that, um, you know, considering some technology, technological restraints of what, how many we can provide at one time, but, uh, you know, all things we're learning about. But we do intend to uh, put more images up on Digital Pacific, which is a hub for digital collections. Um, and yeah, just trying to think through how we can do more projects like through Mukatu, which is thinking about um, you know, centering indigenous knowledge with indigenous collections and providing access in ways that are commensurate with that, um, which I think is gonna be important for us, especially being kind of tied to Los Angeles County, how we can, get the collection out there in a more distance-based approach, but knowing how 
intentional it has to be and you know placed in in specific uh, communities in that way i'm running over i see but <laughs> this is my last slide i promise so um but yeah i just wanted to share the sort of you know the the things that on this ongoing journey are continuing to, to that i'm continuing to chew on at least which one that I think has really come up time and time again in the past couple of weeks, and, and we heard some really lovely stories on the opening. But um, you know, thoughtlessly, I think that in in our collections, when when we don't know something, uh, the the just general tag that goes there is unknown or unattributed. But mm -hmm. that assumes that that knowledge doesn't exist, and of course it does. It just is just it's not placed at LACMA. We just don't know. Mm -hmm. So how can we like think through the ways that we're describing what we don't know in a way that doesn't assume that that knowledge doesn't mm -hmm. exist? Um, so that that's a very clear takeaway that I'm I'm going uh, back home with me. Um, thinking about, um, you know, Michael was talking about how you know some images could be staged in some way, or some images were inscribed in ways that were not accurate. So, in addition to finding knowledge that we didn't have, how do we undo the knowledge that has been, you know, embedded in these images in some cases? Um, so that's going to be an ongoing thing to think about. Um, sensitivity and privacy, of course, we found is, is nuanced and, and people have different takes on it because it's personal and these are personal, it's a family album, so of course that's going to be, you know, something that is different from person to person. So how do we continue to kind of take that feedback and, and, and continue to find ways forward with that? Um, and I think of these last few things, it's really just for me thinking about, yeah, the tension between a place like LACMA that has so many resources, of course the museums are not always uh, just brimming with resources, but we, we do have more than some. And so, you know, how do we, if we're, if we're to con continue to exist and continue to support collections like that, I think we really just need to think about how we direct resources, how we kind of do that, as opposed to assuming that we are, we are the best place for the knowledge. So how do we, how do we think through that? Um, and yeah, just continuing to try to, to also build it more locally. We, are, of course, have a, a very large Pacific Island and Hawaii-based community in uh, Los Angeles County. So I think, again, following from this uh, project, I'm really hopeful that we can really take some, some skills that I've, I've hopefully got from this experience and, and do things more locally in Los Angeles. So those are just some next steps, but of course, it's never done. So um, <laughs> happy to hear um, more feedback and excited to hear more ideas today, too. So. Mahalo. Thank you. Before we move on to our next two panelists, I wanted to see if there anybody has a burning question that they'd like to ask at this point of um, either Michael or Joey. For Joey, so in the 10,000 photos, which which one photo was iconic that took your breath away? Hmm. Well. One of 10,000. My. Okay. <laughs> I'm just running through. Um, I think, well, recently, um, so I, I guess another plug. So um, Mina and I put together a package of images that are on an iPad in the other space that are Big Island specific, and hopefully a way of a form that people can fill out if there's memories, things that come up for you. But um, one of the uh, groups of images was a series from um, the Kohala Seminary Schools, early 20th century, some beautiful portraits. Um, and I, I hadn't noticed them before because of how large the collection is. It was just through this exercise that I was able to, to actually look through them and, and sit with them. So um, I really love that series, um, and I'm hopeful that we might be able to find some, some uh, relatives here and get some connections. So yeah, that's, that's my favorites. <laughs> Absolutely. Wonderful question. Um, Michael, do you have any image or group of images that really stood out to you in this process? No, it was just all of them. And, uh, no, no, but it was like I said, three months of just uh, emotional up and down, uh, crying, and next minute you just like identify because the, uh, there are photographs that sort of mixed up. There actually was a whole uh, series of the, um, the Fijians. Uh, there was a regiment shot of, of, of the guard, and then in Samoa, because I've been trying to find the brass band series. So it's just looking at all the similarity of the histrionics behind it. So, yeah, there's no, the, look, it can keep going. I mean, that's how big this collection is. Yeah. yeah. And it's a good movie. Perfect. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Now we're going to hand it over and I'm going to. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
to Anne-Marie. Aloha kako, mahalo nui to Nina and Halana for inviting me to be part of this panel and mahalo to Donkey Mill. I'm really excited to be here and I don't get an op often get an opportunity to talk about this project that I was a part of. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, a museum exhibit that I was a part of through Bishop Museum. I'm not a curator, I'm a librarian as you heard in my bio, but I was invited to be uh, a collaborator on this exhibit. Um, and this exhibit is called uh, Regenerations, Challenging Scientific Racism in Hawaii. And it focuses on a collection of photos that was taken across Hawaii in the 1920 and 1921 by Lewis R. Sullivan. Um, the reason the photos were taken uh, was to um, measure and classify the physical traits of a supposedly pure Hawaiian and was presented at the second international eugenics conference in 1921 with the support and endorsement of Bishop Museum. Um, and so um, I'll be talking about that more um, a bit, um, but I feel like it's really important to talk about my context and how I ended up being a collaborator on this collection. So you can move to the next slide. Um, these are the people that I am responsible to and for, and so I just wanted to uplift their pictures and their, uh, I won't say all of their names here, but um, these are some of the folks that um, are a big part of my life and how I got to where I am today. Um, as you heard, I was born and raised in California by my father who is from uh, Honolulu Kaimuki and my mother who was born in uh, Troy, Kansas. So they're Allenby and uh, Rebecca, they're here. Um, and I uh, was raised in California, um, going back and forth between those places and of course living a suburban life there. And in my high school years decided that I wanted to pursue Hawaiian studies and found myself in Hilo pursuing a degree in Hawaiian language that I didn't realize I was getting into, but it, it really, <laughs> there it is, <laughs> it was a pivotal, pivotal part of my, my foundations in my life. I also found Hula there and was trained um, under Taupori Tangaro and Unu Kukuku. Um, and so, you know, found very foundational um, points in my life that really helped me to realize that um, I really wanted to help um, perpetuate our Ike Kuna, our Olalo Hawai'i um, in my personal life, but also my professional life as well. I had the opportunity to work at the library at UH Hilo, Mo'okini Library in their Hawaiian collection, and I was also a research assistant for my history professor, Carrie Ingalls, um, and found myself in love with archives. I was able to really uh, dig into primary collections with that work and realized that uh, it was a way for me to access kupuna voices that had been not necessarily accessible um, unless you were really involved heavily in collection management and um, that sort of thing. So made my way to UH Manoa uh, where I uh, obtained my master's in library and information science. I also met my husband on Oahu and we uh, have our family there now. Um, I am the Hawaiian Pacific Resource Librarian at Leeward Community College and um, that is important to know, but also not necessarily important for this talk, but my journey to becoming that um, really was me building my skills and recognizing that in library school I didn't necessarily see myself represented other than among my peers, and I was lucky enough to um, connect with quite a few people who are also Hawaiian, who are also very interested in reclaiming our Ike Kupuna um, through our collections, and we found camaraderie with one another and not necessarily our, our um, faculty and staff, though they did give us good direction. It was really important for us to see ourselves within each other. So I found this really horizontal peer group um, that was really important to my, to my, um, my growth. Um, Mo'oku Ohau research became a really big part of my own journey, my, my own reclaiming of my identity, but also in my current position, I helped quite a few students in their academic journey to find their Mo'oku Ohau as well. And so part of that work was really digging into figuring out how I can help them by understanding other collections. And so that process, uh, I found myself just kind of going to collections and searching through library catalogs and using my skills as a librarian to help uh, figure out where I could find um, information about my kupuna. And I found myself at Bishop Museum's Library and Archives online catalog and just typed in some of my kupuna names that I had found up to that point and was lucky enough to get direct hits on the searches. And it took me about a year or maybe six months, some long a period of time to find the time to get to the library during their open hours, which were like two days a week for like four hours or something like that, <laughs> in the middle of my work day. And so, you know, it was, it was this whole big process. Uh, but when I did find myself there, I was able to um, get into the reading room and asked immediately for the support to, that I wanted to see this particular collection, having no idea what the Sullivan collection was. 
And uh, the lady that was helping me, she was very sweet, and she looked at me and she goes, you know what you're asking for? And I said, no, I'm just looking for my kupuna. And so she goes, okay, hold on, I'll be right back. And so she comes back with the collection and she goes, okay, I just want you to know this is a part of a really creepy study, but these photos are really, really incredible. And so the people that find these photos are really usually taken pretty back. So I just want to warn you before you find them. And um, she was very bright. I immediately started crying. Um, you can go to the next slide and I can show you. So these are the photos that I was able to find of my, sorry. <laughs> Uh, great great grandfather Lameka and his father David Malulani Ho'olapa Aia. They were, these photos were taken here in Kahalu'u. Um, they were both uh, farmers here. Um, these photos are the ones that I'm showing today, but there are also profile photos, and that sort of is a recall back to the reasons why these photos were taken in the first place. Um, is the, uh, the need to document what a pure Hawaiian looks like. Um, <clears throat> and so these are them, and so of course I immediately let the, the library uh, and the archives folks know that, okay, this is, I'm a, I am a descendant of these people, and they were able to sort of mark that into their metadata and so on and so forth. And that was about 2018, um, and then so we're gonna skip ahead to April 2020 where I got this email from uh, Lea Caldera, who was the uh, archivist, and, uh, a, um, and Jillian Swift, who was the head of the anthropology department, and they had let me know that they were planning on doing this really incredible exhibit where they wanted to do this reckoning with Bishop Museum's participation, support, and endorsement of this study. Because this collection, these two photos are just two of, I, I don't know the full collection, but, but many, hundreds of photos that were taken across the Pai'aina. And part of their process in wanting to make sure that they told this story was working directly with descendants of folks that were in this collect, represented in this collection. And there are many. Um, ultimately, um, you can go to the next slide. So ultimately, the, the exhibit came out in um, February of 2021. Um, I don't know how I ended up being the poster girl. There were five. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but there were there were five there were five families that were represented. Uh, at least five of families that were descendants were an active part of the the collaboration and the curation of this exhibit. Um, and so those five families were also there, as well as um, some of the busts. There were there were plaster busts that were he did of some Hawaiians. Um, as far as my I understand, they were not able to made connections with those family members. Um, mm -hmm. They did put them on the exhibit in hopes that maybe family members would, not for lack of trying, they tried really tried to reach out to those folks. But um, yeah, so I was one of five, sorry, I'm gonna look at my notes really quick. Um, and yeah, and so that process was really incredible, um, kind of speaking to the you know allied um, stewardship is, they were really in contact with me a lot. It was COVID, so it was really hard, but we were in contact through the whole process, emailing back and forth, and uh, we did a Zoom interview that was late, later part of the exhibit. Um, and so, yeah, in February 2021, it opened, and then you can go to the next slide, I think. Um, so my ohana was um, displayed there. This is, I'm only gonna talk about my family, though, again, there was five other families. I, just, I don't wanna misrepresent them. Um, but this was the ultimate, the, the display, um, and these are, my dad still lives in California, and so he wasn't able to be there for the opening, although there's a later picture where he is there, but I think the culminating most important thing for me was that I was able to bring my family to see these photos who had, this, these stories have been lost. My great grandmother passed away when my grandma was only 10, and so these stories of this family in Kona, all we knew was that our family was in Kona. We didn't have names, we didn't know any of these things, and so being able to show these huge photos of my family members to my current family members that, um, you know, it, it, they were a part of a generation where assimilation was really what the survival mechanism was um, in order to be, to be able to survive, and really reclaiming these stories and bringing them back here and being able to show them um, how important our family is, and um, all of that was really, really an incredible, incredible experience. And so um, you can show the next slide. My dad and I have not always had the best ex best relationship, despite the fact that I get my mo'oku o'ho Hawaii from him, and um, bringing him to the exhibit and letting him see this work um, has shifted our relationship in ways that I, um, uh, we've really been able to heal a lot of some of the miscommunication. I've been able to early understand some of the empathetic um, 
be more empathetic of his situation and some of the choices he's made in his life um, that have sort of kept us apart and we were able to kind of communicate and it's been through this exhibit that I've been able to do that. Additionally, I just realized this as I was getting on the plane yesterday, every year since this exhibit has been up, I've been invited to come back to Kona and I think it's um, sort of a, you know, a reckoning of um, my, my Kukuna, recognizing that I found, I found them and I think that there's become a relationship there despite the fact that they've um, they're gone. And so I don't know if I hit all the points that I want to talk about, but that is <laughs> my introduction. <laughs> so mahalo nui. Yeah, yeah. Perfect time. Oh, nice! <laughs> further context for what you're sharing. Sure, yeah, yeah, mahalo, yeah, yeah. Mahalo for, for sharing oh, within this space. <laughs> so we brought Anne-Marie specifically onto this panel because we wanted to provide you folks, the audience, with another comparison in terms of projects and exhibitions yeah. that work with communities to reckon with historical photographic collections, right? Some of them are staged, some of them may depict sacred ceremonial purposes, purposes. some of them are created by physical anthropologists for the purpose of eugenics. Um, this particular collection at Bisham Museum is one that really showcases that even though those images were collected for a very particular purpose, that hasn't stopped descendants for decades, really, from accessing those photographs. Because for some folks, it's the only photographs they have of right. their kukuna. Right. Um, as part of the Kona Ohana, I know that some of my ohana is also within that collection. Yes. So it offers, you know, Given the history of these collections, it just gives us a really great example of that the object or the image or the art piece isn't necessarily just exclusively defined by its maker or how it is created or the purpose of it, but that over time and over generations, we do see ways in which you know, it becomes reappropriated, um, pieces of conversation to have really important conver healing conversations within families, but to also you know, unpack some of the, the experiences that we've Based and we continue to kind of struggle through or maybe even innovate within um, as Pacific Islanders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On that note, I'm going to hand it over to another project for Access that we've also included on this team and it will be Teresi. So Teresi, take it away. Hi, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'll try to adhere to the 10 minute requirement. Uh, it's a struggle for me, but I'll, I'll make it happen. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much for the invitation and uh, <clears throat> this is a project that I took uh, part in uh, in 2016 for a year at the Auckland Museum uh, in New Zealand. So it's called uh, Pacific Collections Access Project, so it's PCAP in short. Um, and it's been like one of my favorite projects uh, and I've actually got approval from the uh, project director, uh, Jamie Williams, uh, at the Auckland Museum. Uh, they've kind of seen that even though I've left New Zealand, I've kind of taken this baby with me. And uh, it's like I've kind of claimed it, uh, which I should actually, uh, because this project was a one-year part of my life, and I really, really enjoyed it because it has, um, I think, uh, revolutionized, if I can use that word, mm -hmm. on how we actually access collections. Uh, I've been in the museum uh, scene for uh, maybe about 30 years and a big part of this project has actually um, opened my eyes to see the potential that museum collections can do, you know, to connect with our people. Uh, because for over so many years, I've been working in so many museums, I've noticed that there's a huge gap between museums and the people that actually belong to these collections, yeah. you know, and it's about time we need to reduce that gap. You know, and so this project was one of those bridges, if I can say, that you know, we kind of let our people know, did you know that you have a collection from your village you know, in this museum? You know, and the look on their face like, really? I said, yeah, stop watching rugby, stop picking <laughs> right? Let's go to the museum. And so this is what happened, yeah? So for one whole year, I'd just like to acknowledge my husband who's actually here with me. He's, yeah, he's, he's, he's my driver. Because of this project, I've actually twisted his arm to now he's now doing his PhD. Oh. Yeah. So, yes. you know, I know he doesn't want me to say wow. it, but that is the impact of this project that I'm going to talk about. Okay? So I'm two minutes already into my time. Uh, so I just want to share this map. I love maps. Um, and the reason why I want to share this map is to do with three C's. Uh, I always try and put things into threes. So the three C's is one is to do with context. 
you know, when I, we talk about Oceania, uh, you know, just to try and take people into that region. So I'm from Fiji. I was working at the, um, in New Zealand uh, for a number of years, for 16 years, and now I'm in, um, in Hawaii, and again, talking about this wonderful project. So this project was a four-year project funded by uh, the New Zealand government uh, and uh, um, promoted by the Auckland Museum. So we actually did it alphabetically. So we started with Cook Islands, so I know Michael. <laughs> And then straight after that was Fiji, and I was so thankful because they use uh, the English alphabet. Yeah. Because if they use the Fijian alphabet, we will be the last. Oh. So I was like, thank you. So we were the second. So we were so happy, and we had over 1,700 Fijian artifacts that we have to go through. That's a lot. And so if you go back to the previous picture, the three of us in the middle, we were the um, facilitators. So I really want to acknowledge Chowana Monalangi, uh, my sister from Cerro province, and Ali Pati Trail from the province of Lomeviti. So we were the three who were required to go through the 1,700 artifacts. Mm. And so what we did was, okay, we have to strategize because we cannot do that realistically. So we decided to go through, back to the map, um, and I think the next one, okay, to go through Fiji using the three confederacies. So those of you who may not know that, in Fiji we have 14 provinces, so it's divided into 14 provinces, but then the 14 provinces is, to pu is put into three confederacies. So the only way we could effectively go through all of them was through the three confederacies. And I think that was the smartest decision we've ever made because we were able to go through the 1,700 artifacts using that three confederacy template. And so what we did, we worked with people from that confederacy in New Zealand. And so we looked through the artifacts list and we're like, okay, we are not covers, you know, um, some of us are not weavers. So what we did, we look at the, ca the categories and we're like, who is the expert in the community in New Zealand that we can invite in? And that was amazing, right? That was amazing. So we went through the, uh, the, wood, the wood carving collection and we identified there was a carver, a descendant of a carver living in Auckland. So we got his address, we drove to his house, <laughs> yeah, and we did quite a lot of that, which was amazing, right? Um, sometimes they feed us, sometimes they don't, but that's okay. Um, but it was amazing that we were able to invite not only this person, but this person brought so many others. And so we had a Kumbuna Day, which is one of the Confederacy. Uh, we had a Tovata Day, another Confederacy. And we had a Burmbasana Day, another Confederacy, where we got so many Fijians into the building. And after the project finished, the director of this project said, Teresa, how did you find these people? And I said, they're always here. But if you feed them, they'll come. Okay, so next one. And so I just want to show you this, this video. It's one of my favorites because this project actually focused on many of these treasures that we didn't even know existed. And so the Auckland Museum was so amazing that they brought the librarians, man, the librarians were amazing, <laughs> the archivists, and even the film people that we didn't even know existed in the museum. They came in and they made these videos and they told the story. And we showed them to the people and then the memories started coming out. You know, the story, people were like, I remember my grandfather had one in his house. And so we're like, we better record that person. And so we went around the room and it was, oh my goodness, amazing. So more information we didn't expect came out. Okay, can we just play this video? <coughs>
with our people and just a few other slides that I have here uh, one thing we found out that we were able to uh, talk about a lot of our oral history that we actually don't normally talk about uh, which was amazing so I just have a few slides just to share um, uh, that was <clears throat> part of the work that we did was you know trying to identify the names um, <clears throat> so a lot of these artifacts were just having you know Edzas Fiji you know, had all the English names. Yeah. So when we came in, we renamed them. Mm -hmm. So if you go online and if you click um, Fiji under the PK project, you'll notice that our uh, database have all the Fiji names mm -hmm. in front and then the English names after. Mm -hmm. So that was a beautiful uh, connection that we could give. Mm -hmm. And then a few other slides we'll just talk about. So this was a Tova today, one of the confederacy that I spoke about, where we were able to invite others to come in and share the story. And the next one. Um, we were able to identify the project and rename it to our language. So the Cook Islands had theirs, the Fiji, we call it Nayeo Bakaviti Naka Maringeti. So that was the uh, theme that we used for the whole 12 months. Mm. Next one. And this lady, uh, Kulaya Bukivea, she came in into the collection because she's one of our master weavers uh, in New Zealand. And uh, something amazing happened that day when she was holding on to this, uh, um, this fan. Um, she just broke into a dance, uh, which was, uh, you know, unplanned, and she just danced the whole way through, and lucky in that room, we had a video going, and uh, uh, someone was taking photos, and I had my phone right there, and I just pressed record, and we recorded her performing a dance, you know, which was, again, another um, direct impact of working, you know, with these treasures that we wouldn't have known that this lady knew how to weave. She told us this, the skills of how to weave them, but she also had a memory of a dance that she danced when she was very young. Wow. So that was beautiful. Wow. And uh, as a result of this, uh, you know, uh, knowledge holders coming in into the museum, we were able to talk about the different ro um, roles that every Fijian were born into. So in our culture, you are born into a certain tribe. So my dad's family, we are warriors. And then the lady that I spoke about, she is a weaver. So we were able to identify that that was the role that her great-great-grandmother did so many generations ago. Mm -hmm. So it was really nice that this project was able to you know, bring that role discussion come alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then more as well. So I'm a warrior. There are others who are carpenters, covers and the others who are fisher folk. So when we were going through the collections, when we look at the, you know, the fishing tools, we were like, who can we bring in? So it was kind of becoming a natural pr uh, progression after that. Okay. I think uh, this is the result of what we did. So now when you go into the database, rather than just seeing a clay water vessel Fiji, you have the Fiji name in the front. So we've got Sangamoli, and then the next one, Kitungele. And that was the event we uh, did to actually close the project uh, in uh, Auckland, which was amazing. Uh, we had uh, community leaders from all over New Zealand who were present on the day. Um, so I just want to share that, that these kind of projects, you know, if you're looking at how do we connect with our community, if we start first, right, if we do 
uh, make that first step, the community will come. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's us. Thank you. Thank you to all of the panelists for their wonderful contributions today. Um, before we open it up um, to all of the panelists, similar to earlier, does anyone have any burning questions for either Anne-Marie or Teresi that they'd like to ask? I have one question to each. Mm -hmm. anyway, thank you so much. It's so beautiful that everybody shared each one of you. And I'm, just, I'm just cheering up like, by you, know, you sharing the stories all the pieces. Mm -hmm. So a question to Anna Marie. I just got my uh, attention on the poster. It said uh, it's a scientific racism. Yeah. yeah. I was mm -hmm. like, I need to ask you what that means in the context. Um, so I can talk a little bit about that. Hold on. So um, essentially, eugenic. Could you show that maybe again? Yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> So she's talking about the name of the, the presentation and it's called Challenging Scientific Racism. And so uh, race science and eugenics have been long used to justify things like slavery and uh, you know things in the Holocaust. And so it's, eugenics is uh, long outdated. Uh, it's been uh, you know, shown to not be a, a form of <laughs> scientific inquiry that we should be paying attention to uh, or should we should be doing. It's been fairly extractive, done primarily by Western um, scientists coming into indigenous or other groups, uh, groups and cultures to sort of do what we were talking about, documenting what a pure person of that particular race looks like. Um, and so the idea again behind this was to um, talk about the fact that Lewis R. Sullivan was a eugenic scientist and presented this work, presented these photos, of which there were hundreds of photos and the busts to the Second International Eugenics Conference, uh, which I th believe took place in New York. And so the idea behind the naming of this was to sort of talk about challenging Bishop Museum's endorsement of that study and of that work and their participation in work that has been um, outdated and um, no longer something that they want to be necessarily aligned with, mm -hmm. but also using this to sort of reckon with that really problematic past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll add some further context yeah, too, because be the, um, the the particular collection, and as we, as many of us know here, Bishop Museum's legacy is one of salvage anthropology within Hawaii and the Pacific, and what that term means is we're talking about anthropologists, particularly in the early 20th century, who would essentially go around to different places, collecting as much as they could within the context of um, really considering a lot of cultures and communities dying out. Um, yeah. Particularly in Hawaii, during the same time period as this conference in the 1920s, there I remember reading Alfred Kroper, who was an anthropologist that did a lot of work in California, um, came to Honolulu to talk about kind of what is the value of doing ethnographic work in Hawaii. And his remarks were that, you know, the only good thing that you can do within Hawaii is to document archaeological sites and dig through the archives because Hawaiians at that time weren't practicing quote unquote traditional ways anymore. And part of the challenge of that is that you know, the legacy of anthropology means that um, although the collections and the projects were done at that time for very particular reasons. The legacies of those projects has resulted in what we see today where we have lots of tensions over what is traditional and what isn't traditional, what is authentic culture and what is not authentic mm -hmm. culture. Um, and it created a very weird situation where we're constantly looking back even before like our great grandparents when it comes to our cultural practices mm -hmm. in the ways that even in the 1920s, Hawaiian practices were continuing, they just didn't look the same. Right. <laughs> right. So oftentimes when we read these early ethnographic accounts, we have to read them with a grain of salt because as at once, they're providing us with information on what people are doing, but at the same time, there are ways in which we can sometimes use that same rhetoric to either dismiss how other people's practices have been continued in their families, uh, maybe even um, dismiss counter narratives from what might be the master story of a particular place or an incident within our cultures. So 
Yeah, that's just the anthropology side because yeah. I haven't uh, trained in anthropology. I'll just add to that um, part of challenging this scientific racism aspect was the fact that um, because so much was lost right at that time, um, one of our webinars that happened during the course of this um, exhibit was talking about the fact that a eugenics um, cu curriculum was being taught at Kamehameha schools at the time, and so really um, being up that was in embedding themselves into our community to sort of demonstrate this this really problematic um, science. And so the use, as was my case, um, the use of this collection has really shifted into becoming more about returning our um, our people today, our descendants, to you know those mo their mo'oku'oho, being able to see that. And so how heavily the, and prominently this collection is used is for genealogy research, despite its really problematic origins. And so I think that was that was a big part of it is sort of reckoning with that really problematic way of, of collecting this information. And yet, for me in particular and many others, it was really, really useful and really, really powerful to be able to see it, you know, to be able to have it. And so figuring out how to mahalo these repositories for collecting in this material in some, you just, is, is really hard to kind of reconcile because it's, I don't. I don't feel great that they, he was taken in that way. You know, like looking, looking in that extractive way, and also it's allowed me to see him. So, hello. Yeah. All right. Before we open it up to everybody, I wanted to give our panelists an opportunity to share any maybe thoughts that arose as you heard other panelists, or maybe a question that you might want to ask mm. the group. If if anything came up for you folks. Yeah, I think the the state uh, going through. The collection and yeah, that uh, eugenics uh, scientific carry on. I mean, it's, I mean, I'm really familiar with the collection, especially when um, Deutschland was uh, we were under German rule in Samoa, and because I spent so much time over in Deutschland looking at all the different collections there, you can see all the different staged, staged images, and then trying to get my head around the you know, putting the dignity back into our wahine. Because there was a period where those photographs were taken in Samoa, you know, for a particular reason, for, to source another, to fill another gap here, a tourist gap. Mm -hmm. And so what they were doing was they're taking the photos and, 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 and also eugenically sort of staged as well. Mm -hmm. Then they ended up being disseminated here in Hawaii. Then they ended up disseminated in California. So you can actually track track what was going on at that time. You know, you don't have. To, you don't even have to be a scientist, you just break it all down. But what the sad part about it is what is trying to get the dignity back to our wahine, our wahine door. Because you're looking at my mum, and you wouldn't do talk, take a photo of my mum like that. And so for, that's come a problematic thing, you know, I'm looking at my sister. So it's trying to give some dignity back to the unknown person of the photograph, is what I've been negotiating. When Joey was sitting there, he said, you might, you might find it quite difficult. And I said, no, I was prepared because I was matured enough now to sort of understand what we're looking at here. You know? And we're trying to move forward, not playing the victim, but just looking at actually how we, our, how my mum or Wahine are portrayed and how these photographs ended up in California. Mm -hmm. and ended up, you know, in that, that, in that space. And then the scientific, so we August Krema, was there at that time under German rule again collecting photographs to see the size and shape, you know, and then all of a sudden you sort of like how do we use that as the vehicle to create a space where we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. So I am familiar with what you're talking about. We had a really good discussion and it's still traumatizing and again, you know, yeah. we had to really negotiate how we look at these photographs mm -hmm. because they are the uh, they are other people's uh, final and family. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm putting it to luck, but you do realize the responsibility you have of our uh, Fano mm -hmm. and that you need us to actually respond and give us the space to give some dignity back, especially to our wahine. You know, that's the bit I'm having a, an issue with. But not to sort of go after anyone, just to try and find, provide spaces that we can run workshops. Or, uh, like in the museum, you know, so we can actually give it some dignity back. Mm -hmm. You know, Mike, as you're talking, and you and Joy touched on this um, in our conversation, was that listening is such an important practice within this kind of work because listening isn't just listening to the museum professionals and the recommendations they're making, but it's really listening to what 
your stakeholders are bringing to the table, what community members are bringing to the table, and not trying to dismiss them and you know the, the emotions they carry around certain images. Yes, something may have, a, a historical image may have been duplicated thousands of times on a postcard, but that could still be their ancestor. Mm -hmm. There's a story, there's an experience, there is a human behind those images. And so it really, you know, I love, I love thinking about listening because oftentimes it's not just uh, I'm hearing what they're saying, but it's also trying to think more deeply about what else is being said with what they're vocalizing. Mm -hmm. um, Joy, did you, did you have anything that you wanted to add with regards to um, the collection and your guys' work so far on that? Yeah, I mean, um, and I feel like both Anne Marie and Teresa kind of touched on this too, which is, you know, knowing the massive kind of disconnect between what can be found in our collections and, and where the, the source communities are based. And, you know, thinking about some of the other people I've been talking about that are working in collections of similar nature that, you know, might not be able to have the luxury of digitizing their holdings. You know, there's a good likelihood that there's overlap there. And thinking about how, you know, the service that that we can offer having digitized so many things is working with the spaces that are already known community spaces that, you know, I'm not going to identify any specific organizations because we still have to kind of figure out logistics of how this might work. But just even being in the space, like the number of people that came through and that hour, like wanting to look through images of Kapuna and to be able to find things. And so just thinking about, you know, particularly with a photographic collection and the mass produced nature of it, like there, there isn't any like real reason why LACMA would would not be actually identifying connections in those spaces, just given the nature of the holdings, but also because it's the right way to make those connections. But yeah, you know. oh, fantastic. Do either of you have anything you'd like to add to or share? Yeah, I think one of the points that uh, Joey mentioned in uh, in his talk is looking at you know sharing versus gatekeeping. Um, you know that's actually a very important uh, point. Um, because it can be quite um, uh, difficult for those who work in the museum but also those of us who come from the source communities but I think many heritage institutions um, is changing now and I think change is good um, because for me I'm trying to kind of go away from the gatekeeping you know and looking at how can we connect yeah. with the people because to me at the end of the day whatever collections you're looking after whether it's artifacts or photographs or or moving image, you know, it's the people that matters the most. You know, we are the ones that provide that oxygen, you know, to what was collected, you know, so many years ago. So even though we inherited them, but I think if we work uh, very smart with the people that we you have in your institution or with the community, with the work that I did, you know, you can be able to get the right people to come in, you know, to identify, you know, those uh, artifacts that may be unknown that eventually can connect to Hawaii or to Samoa, you know, Kyokaha or to Fiji. So they, these are some really good examples that we can all work together and, and share and identify because people in the source communities, they're always there ready to come. You know, if we identify grants, I'm looking at you, madam. Uh, <laughs> you know, so if we identify grants and identify some, you know, university graduates or those who work in the community, we can make it happen. Yeah. You know, as you're planning these for your institutions, always remember to add a line item for food. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, within within a lot of cultures within our region in Oceania, mm. feasting, mm. eating is such an important aspect of connecting with one another, but also making sure people are sustained in that process, yes. that yeah. you're not yeah. just inviting them for a talk and then right. bye-bye, right. Mm. Uh, but really trying to cultivate those relationships mm. and um, um, doing it in a way that supports and, mm. and creates a space where people want to come back yes. and feel welcome. Yeah. So we have about 20 minutes left of mm -hmm. our panel conversation and we wanted to use this time to open it up to you folks uh, for any question, uh, questions you have for the panelists or an individual amongst their panel. Um, maybe even if you don't have a question, some of the thoughts that you have or comments. I have a question but I want to um, contextualize it. I just um, so uh, deeply moved and uh, I have the privilege of being part of the Native Hawaiian Ohana and um, my question really comes from that is I 
just been in touch with all the changes with COVID and mm. land ownership and identity. And um, my question is not really well defined, but just how are you all continuing to hold the poignancy and problems around permissions? Because, um, you know, this issue came up again with what will in the future be a historical photograph, but is not a historical photograph. Well, it is historical now, but um, you know when uh, Tutu Pele yeah. erupts, it's a, you know, geological event that's historical. Um, it's a tourist event. <laughs> that you know causes excitement and traffic problems but it's also you know obviously a spiritual event for those especially related to Tutu Pele like my native Ohana Kapele Ohana is and so um, in the Mauna the, the recent Mauna Loa eruption which also erupted on Hawaiian Independence Day so it had even a more special meaning for some Hawaiians. Um, I had a colleague who's an artist and a therapist go to uh, um, and when she was there taking photographs, there was a halal practicing, mm -hmm. not practic uh, practicing meaning not performing, but practicing their spiritual practice of of hula connecting to to, to Pele, and she took photographs and there were other people taking photographs and you know she told me that um, people in the Hala were upset because yeah. that, that that wasn't um, they didn't want their photograph taken right and then so she sat with what to do with this photograph you know my partner Hinano and I were listening to the story and you know she wanted to use it to make art to document right and um, but they didn't respond to give her permission. But it made me think, you know, what happens now? With cell phones with, I mean, you know, with images, especially of people practicing their spiritual practice, but yet it is now a public space. But of course, it's Hawaiian owned land, right? Um, regardless of what happened with the illegal overthrow. Um, so I just wonder how are you all um, even holding that for the future because this let's say she did share this with somebody or with you know a museum or I'm in you know, I'm faculty at Hawaii Community College with an educational institution who wants to use it for educational purposes so there's all these different good intentions and yet there is also a crossing of boundaries that re-traumatizes um, you know, people who have been colonized mm -hmm. once again, as happens you know, countless times a day, every single day for many native clients here. So I just wondered if any of you have anything to share about that and then um, Anne Marie afterwards, I'd just love to hear how my Ohana might be able to um, connect with the exhibit and see if any of their them might um, also be a part of it. They're from Kapu and also Ohana district, so possibly. Yeah. Um, I could share a few remarks and give you folks okay. a little bit of time to, read, to think of your responses. <laughs> but uh, an excellent question, right? Because mm -hmm. as much as this kind of ongoing work is happening, we're at the same time still dealing with issues around tourism and people thinking that they can do what they want and just <laughs> show up and take pictures of people doing protocol. Like, no. <laughs> so, so there's these, these multiple layers in which we have to navigate when we do this work. And I think when it comes to projects like this, it's remembering you know, that the larger context is trying to hold spaces where we can have these critical conversations around these issues that have been happening for decades, especially here in Hawaii. Uh, you know, the example that you speak of, I, I understand it because that has happened multiple times when you're just trying, when you're with a group of people offering ceremony, not just to acknowledge the space, but perhaps the entities there, and then people just kind of like, 
Yeah. It's also really, remin it's not reminiscent, it's also really indicative of the times that we live in where social media and mm -hmm. cell phones make it really easy for folks to just snap a picture whenever they want to. Mm -hmm. uh, within those settings and contexts we do know and we've, I'm sure many of us have stories here too about having to just kind of put people in their place in the moment and say this is not appropriate to do in this moment because of these regions and um, it depends on you know you might get the, the the someone who will lash out at those people because of it you might have someone who will kind of explain it more it really depends on who's at the table but ultimately it's just about being a better guest when you're here in hawaii and in other parts of the pacific asking questions or asking permission before rather than after the fact. I think there's also an a, a MO nowadays where we'll just do it and then ask after mm -hmm. the fact when really it should be the opposite way around. Mm -hmm. I mean, when it comes to Ike um, Ku'una Hawaii, as Anne-Marie talked about, asking permission is the start of that relationship, mm -hmm. not the end. <laughs> and it and helps it's you usually to an apology. It's not even asking permission. Right, 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 right. Yes. And so, you know, trying to bring those practices back and to also just kind of remind folks of humility, of being respectful when you visit these places. Um, it's going to be ongoing, right? There's not necessarily a single answer to kind of solve everything, mm -hmm. but it's part of an active practice of our connections to those places, of perhaps encouraging others to not do those kind of invasive ways of when they visit these places, but to also, again, get back to talking story with each other, mm -hmm. um, building empathy, building cross-cultural mm -hmm. understanding so that mm -hmm. you know, maybe in the next generation more people are more aware of these things. Mm -hmm. um, so that maybe there's less people who are surrounding the halal with their cameras out, but doing their own thing on the sites. Mm -hmm. Any other kind of thoughts or comments mm -hmm. from folks here? Anne -Marie. Yeah, I'd be happy to share. Um, Mahalo well, for the question. I think um, you know what you're talking about is a, an extension and a continuation of um, this over romanticization and performative component of the way that outsiders kind of see our culture and see who we are and so it continues in that way and I think one of the ways it bringing it kind of trying to bring it back to collections and museums thinking about how we can use opportunities like this to give agency back to um, these people that are you know uh, these collections and this Ike belongs to and figuring out ways to help make this more of a mainstream understanding that we need to care for one another, that care of collective care is kind of how we push back on these things and how we start to bring up the standards for with which people come here visiting and moving here, what it means for you to be a part of this community. I think for so long we've been subject to um, an outsider perspective of who we are and that's helped to define who we are to ourselves as well. And so, so a lot of this too is our own introspective work, pushing back on our own um, you know, inherent stereotypes and stigmas that we've picked up because of the learning that has been put on us through systems that we don't necessarily control. Access to our land is something not that we don't necessarily control. And so the ways that we can control is to figure out how collectively we can work together to care for one another and bring up that standard with which we operate within one another in relation relationships. And I think that um, calling out and holding people accountable is part of one, of one of those ways in which we need to feel more confident within ourselves to be able to do that because that is extending that agency of who we are in our collections and our in our, our practices. Um, and so I think that's just what I would add to that. So Mahalo, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'll respond by saying that, yeah, it's these were conversations that came up pretty early on in the advisory board discussions. And I feel like, well, we also learned that we need to have a lot more time for those conversations because they mm -hmm. took place over, I think, maybe yeah. six hours. And that was time. definitely not enough mm -hmm. to really process mm -hmm. all the different vantage points, right. the, the sort of context across the islands, knowing that you know, it's not always going to be a shared understanding of you know, what, what practice is, is appropriate or not to, to document in that kind of way. Um, so I feel like, you know, based on what we're hearing already about, um, you know, the, the act of permission versus uh, forgiveness is, is, I think, by just sitting in that conversation, learning to sort of lead by the relationships and, and figuring out how consent is formed through that process as opposed to, you know, just whatever kind of, you know, cursory research is performed and which would probably typically be the case for one, how we would vet things to put them out and to 
the, the ether of the internet. Um, and so I think we've decided to sort of, yeah, reverse that process in this time. And so it's, it's a slower process than I think we're used to. And that's where you also get up against the tension of, of gatekeeping too much because it feels like years have gone by and you've still only eked out a few images to even promote awareness for it. But yeah. I think we're still mm -hmm. kind of figuring out how to embody that process. Mm -hmm. But I want to piggyback off this question because one of the things that, as you were talking, one of the things that came up for me as well is different types of art and the different approaches that artists have. So within mm -hmm. the situation you explained, it really sounds like a, you know, there's oftentimes the, the artist as a soul maker kind of um, idea where they have the skill sets, they're making art for the sake of art. Mm -hmm. But there's also artists, and I think this exhibit and Michael's work in particular shows this, is that art can also be a social practice. It is a practice in which you bring community in to have conversations, to be able to raise issues, and to create artwork communally. Much different process than the kind of artist as soul maker kind of a mindset, which is not a bad thing, right? Artists make all the time. But there's definitely an importance with you know, using art as a vehicle to do a really incredibly important community work. Uh, Michael, do you want to say a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, it's, I'd say it's all to do with uh, the mental well-being. Um, when you receive, like uh, when we're doing a fale or something, fale, or doing a tapea, or when we're doing a tatouage, it's a group effort. We're making the, the siyaku, you know, it's a group effort. And I guess that's what, it's the, you've got the concept of like uh, the art maker, yes, you've got the, the victim in the room, not going to be a painter, but besides that, when you're taking it from uh, or Samo or whatever view from the from the Akiwa, it's a it's a group thing. So it's not down to the sauce, down to actually even the food. We we made sure I made this really clear to me now, so that we need to make sure that we have the kakai. But what are we eating? You know, and we get through this beautiful process explaining exactly what we're eating. Mm -hmm. And then collectively uh, we're in the process of like talking through the patent system. You know, it, it's our mathematics. And again, going back to the photographs, I mean, they're great references because we're going, I'm trying to reference from the past, like, the, you know, all the lashings, you know, for the va'a, for the architecture, that is our mathematics. You know, and the science approach we are with the color, you know, the moon cycles, there's a synergy. We keep talking about synergy. So I just see these as opportunities to claim that some of that space back and give some dignity back. Mm -hmm. Actually, I went for a, go near the marae and I was constantly having conversations the, these rock tech talking to me like take one, take one, no mm -hmm. and so I know the, the etiquette when you're going around the marae space you know and these rocks are all falling out to you but it's like nah because you know what the the, uh, the procedure is and then all of a sudden you see this amada of tourists coming to this space and that's what mm -hmm. I'm um, Yes, yeah, it's, it's just an interesting one, you know. Mm -hmm. But then having these workshops and these conversations with these quality, I think it's really important. We and and trying to empower mm -hmm. people that don't know about what our, what is the etiquette mm -hmm. when you walk into the marae. What is the etiquette when you're running right. such workshops? Mm -hmm. Because if we don't have these conversations, we're just going to continue walking over each other mm -hmm. and just assuming mm -hmm. um, and to take a picture when you want to. Because mm -hmm. there are spaces where you can do that but again respectfully for those photographers that did take those photos we've got a factual we've got some evidence at least because what we've been doing is dissecting dissecting just the um, binary uh, codes on the fali, the Samoa fali for example or actually the there's a photo up there at my village at uh, Bariki with the, the dancers. Mm -hmm. There's a whole series in, in the, in the Lakmai collection and, mm -hmm. I, and I want to take those photos back to Torotunga mm -hmm. because we want to work out oh, what's that dance and how much the costume has uh, changed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we can sing to it. Yeah. To be, just like the madam who had the fan, you know, it's that yes. opening up that dialogue. Mm -hmm. So it's not just amongst us, mm -hmm. it's empowering the outside community so they can least pay some respect. Because I'm aware of your space at the, the Marae that we cookie got taken out. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Papaya Ligi. Yeah, there, mm -hmm. down there. So, the, yeah, the rocks were talking to me, but I was just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't touch anything. Just, just look with your eyes. But then with the tourists, you know, I'm sort of thinking, man, it must be overwhelming for the Manu Whenua with all this chaos going on. And where, where, they, where do they get to have the chance? Even though you've got the signs, 
the historical scan that you know code someone's talking to you, but where's the uh, the engagement? Mm -hmm. And there I go back. I go back to uh, Uncle Chucky. He's taken off that off that space. He's over here. And back at home, it's like having the mother Fenway on that space, so they're able to. Okay, this is actually how it operates. We still are here. We're still around. This is the funny part. It's like we're still, we're actually still eating the same food. Mm -hmm. So with the combs, it's like combing through the history. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Thank you. We're gonna take one more question. If anyone has a burning one, oh. they'd love to share. So I'll just hand up. For people who come and engage with this exhibition and similar collections, who may be from the source communities, what recommendations do you have in terms of steps they can take and resources that they can seek out if they're trying to also trace their millennial line, um, their, own, their own genealogy? and make those connections with the family. Anyway, I don't know if you want to speak to that. I mean, we're still figuring it out. I mean, I think it's also, and it's, it's been interesting to, to step out of even, you know, just general terms around, like, how data is, is collected around yeah. collections like this. And, you know how that can some of some of those words even sometimes feel like sort of rooted in colonialism or how they're being like you know phrased even though like you know even if they were agreed upon nomenclature but for example there's like i had a big discussion recently with some some other practitioners around this related to data harvesting and yeah. how that like you know has yeah. Yeah. depending on the context that it comes out around it but same with like um yeah just just um Capturing is another word that I've been kind of chewing on too, which is like, you know, of course for our purposes, we want to collect and gather the stories around these these images and do so in a way that, you know, can can have a more direct relationship with them and so that those, you know, can remain coupled in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the the process I think is one that I've also been trying to be sensitive about because, you know, you also have to be mindful about how you know, LACMA intends to use that story and yeah. make sure that we're getting the permissions to use that story in the right ways too. So yeah, it's, I think it's, it would be helpful for me to know as people are engaging with the collection for that purpose, you know, what, how they want to see the images used mm -hmm. and also how they want the stories used. Um, I don't know, I know that's a very vague response, but it's still something that we're, we're kind of, um, how can someone find more information if they're connecting? Yeah. Mm, oh, I see, yeah. yeah. Mm. I can take a stab at that really quickly. So, I, great question, because when I hear the question for me, it's a question that also asks us, you know, what is the potential feature of our museums here on Hawaii Island? Mm -hmm. I'm a big museum nerd. I mm -hmm. went into this field because of doing similar work with actual photographic collections. I brought some photographs from the Lyman Museum oh, yeah. back to Keokaha and ran a one-day event with our elders to just talk story. Yeah. And in that process, you know, it, for them, it was the first time that they felt like the Lyman Museum actually went outside of their institution mm -hmm. to do work in the community. Mm -hmm. But it also gave them an idea of, wow, I actually have stuff there that my mm -hmm. family must have used mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. um, you know, have in the collections. Mm -hmm. So from that, um, you know, one of the things I, I am a very firm believer in is that our small museums in Hawaii and elsewhere are really providing the models for the future in terms of the museum field. I mean, yeah, we see we get high, all the big art museums, the millions of dollars with the high traction and are constantly talked about, but it's really the small spaces that are doing the incredibly important work of cultivating community and having these kinds of conversations. And on Hawaii Island in particular, I believe that you know we're we have the potential to create what I guess that you could call a, muse, um, a, museo, a museum ecology, where you know we just have to be in greater conversation with one another. So when there is a visitor who has this moment and we're listening to them and and their desire to actively connect, we can point them to well, if these are your ancestors, maybe you could check in with the Kona Historical Society, great resource for folks in Kona. Um, that will kind of start them on that journey, who we'll also has people there who can then lead them to other genealogical resources. Maybe it's to go to the Bishop Museum. Um, for Native Hawaiian genealogies, there's so much already online. That's another aspect of digital access. 
that um, sometimes it's just knowing enough to then point people into that direction. Mm -hmm. And part of that is cultivating these conversations, not just with community, but with other institutions, so that we're not necessarily continuing to operate in a, we have to keep our audiences as much as we can, but how do we encourage audiences and communities to come across to all of our institutions and to really see these places as community gathering spaces as opposed to just like the soul exhibit or like the place you go for like the art workshop. But there's so much more that can take place, especially when we invest in these places and really reclaim them and make them into spaces that work for community. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I could, yeah, I could take a stab. Um, uh, let's see. For, well, for my particular experience, it was um, very much me seeking it out. You know, I was really trying to seek out. And so part of that, I think, is going to be some of the ini of the person or the desire of the, the individuals or the communities to want to seek out some of this information. I think that's a big part of it. But I do think that what Halana is talking about is it's, it's going to be on the people with the resources to divert the resources back to the people as well, yeah. meaning doing initiatives like this that will bring the collections outside of the actual physical building. I think one thing that um, has been kind of running through my mind that I want to speak to is that these are not innately systems or institutions that are, you know, the ways that we housed our, our knowledge or the ways that we uh, engaged in our knowledge or had relationship or practiced our knowledge. Our knowledge was in our relationships and in our practice and then the ways that we sort of uh, interacted with one another and it wasn't so much about the building as it's such a focus now. And so figuring out how do we sort of uh, negotiate bringing some of that more uh, traditional ways of engaging with yeah. each other and cultivating and and mm -hmm. being creating knowledge how do we how do we do that again um, with the buildings and the systems that we do have and so I think um, you know someone coming in that's wanting to be connected I think it's partially about consent recognizing that a lot of these photos were maybe non-consensual but figuring out if you yourself want to be connected figuring out what are your own um, ways of wanting to interact with these institutions, recognizing that the institutions haven't always had our best interests at heart, and also um, on that institution side, figuring out how to develop policies and practices within their own uh, spaces that allow for the safety of the, the community members that want to engage with this work. Um, I don't know, that feels like very big and very vague, but I, I hope that that kind of, yeah, yeah. Tracy, yeah. Uh, might you have any stories of, you know, how genealogy may have come up with the PCAP project you're working on. Yeah, <clears throat> I think uh, one of the things I was thinking of as well was um, uh, using the networks that's already existing, like for example like in Hawaii we have the Hawaii Museum Association, the um, archives network, so those are some oh. of the existing networks that are already there. I think for the Donkey Mill and a few, a few other museums like Lyman, I think they need to have those information maybe on their websites, so it's accessible yeah, for people, accessible you know? So I think that's one huge step that everyone can do. So rather than reinventing the wheel, there's already organizations like, for me, I also wear the head of Pima, which is the Pacific Island Museums Association. So if anyone tries to connect to Samoa, the Samoa Museum, they usually come through the website of Pima, and then we kind of, you know, get people to connect with their source community if they're trying to connect back to the Pacific. That's just kind of one example, yeah? Um, but in the Pacific Collection uh, Access Project, yes, we have so many amazing stories. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, I think it, you know, it's to do with, um, with people, you know? If you are at the right place at the right time and asking the right questions, you know, it's amazing how you know, things can align you know, and you actually get your questions answered. Uh, just to give you an example, in uh, uh, Auckland during our uh, PCAP project, so Fiji, again, as I was saying before, is divided into the three confederacies. But then one day, I came into the museum, the curator called me and said, oh, uh, that table over there, those are the, the Fijian artifacts that we've got for you. And I looked at them and I said, that's, that's not Fijian. And they're like, no, it has Fiji on the label. I said, okay, but I can tell they're not Fijian. And so I looked closely, and then I found out that that's from another island in Fiji called Rotuma. Yeah. So it's a Polynesian island, and it's part of Fiji. So no wonder the Fiji label was there. <clears throat> and so to cut the long story short with that amazing question from Helena, thank you for the question, um, was the ability for us to kind of like, okay, we have Rotumans here in Auckland. 
So rather than me pretending to make it like uh -huh. Fijian, I, 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 I was like, I'm not being justice to these people. Mm -hmm. I need to find the recruitments. Yeah. And so we got them. We got them to come in, and it was amazing. 150 of them turned up. Wow. The curators asked me, how did you find them? I said, food. <laughs> okay. Number two, we actually used the snowball effect. I was able to find one rotuman, and it multiplied. Yeah. <laughs> and then on the day, we ended up, before the, you know, we had the Confederacy Day, before the Fijians had their own day, the Rotumans had this first. And it was moving, you know, it was amazing where the genealogy, you know, they were able to come and find all their baskets and all their weaving, but it was just because of what, you know, one person in the museum was able to identify through that, that table of artifacts that was meant for me, but I realized that, hey, that's not mine, yeah. you know? But it was again, you know, a, a moving experience, again, coming back to people, right time, right place, right questions, and we were able to, you know, get the Rotuman community to come in. 150 of them came in, danced, sung, and ate for one whole day, you know? And again, add more information into the database of the Auckland Museum, but not only that, now, their language is now being taught yeah. officially in New Zealand because their uh, language is one of the ones that are cl close to extinction uh, through UNESCO. So it's now it's really great to see wow. the language being taught just from that experience itself. Wow. So I just thought I'd share that.